Welcome to our webinar between ProShip and Invista, Back to the Future, Controlling Shipping Costs, Capacity and Constraints in the 2022 Supply Chain. All right, and with me today is Mark Taylor. Mark, wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, hi, I'm Mark Taylor. I'm the Director of Parcel Consulting at Invista. My role at Invista is to help shippers reduce costs by negotiation and parcel analytics. And the industry background I have is 20 years in the industry, uh, a decade with FedEx, and another decade in roles as a shipper and as a consultant. So happy to be here today with you, Justin. Happy to have all that experience. And I'm Justin Kramer, uh, one of the co-founders of ProShip and the current VP of Sales and Marketing. Uh, I've been in the industry over 20 years. Many of you have heard this story already. I'm not gonna go too deep into the details. Let's keep moving to get to what the people want. All right. Today, we're gonna to talk about a lot of things. First, we're gonna start by looking back. How did last year go? Did everything we expected actually happen? If not, how was it a little different? Then we're gonna start looking to this year. What are the surcharges? What are we seeing? Specifically, we're gonna focus on the major carriers because there are so many carriers out there nowadays. We're gonna look at strategies you might wanna implement. And of course, now, first quarter, is a great time to start uh, looking at implementing those strategies. We're gonna look at carrier expansion because capacity is still a concern. We're gonna pause for a minute. We're gonna, uh, Mark and I will get a chance to actually sum everything up that we've been trying to talk to you about today. And then uh, if we didn't get to all the questions during the process, we'll go ahead and we'll have a Q&A session. Again, you can start submitting those questions now so we can try to work them in uh, to the process as we go along. Start off with, let's look at what happened in 2021. Okay, so to start with, uh, uh, we expected a 5 million package a day deficit. This was straight from the CEO of UPS. And as we, as we look at uh, uh, one of the polls that ProShip ran, you can see that, that carrier capacity constraints was a very solid number two concern for most of, uh, uh, of our poll recipients. So we did see a lot of enforcement of quotas, okay? Uh, we did see, uh, however, to relieve this, we saw a couple of things that happened as well. So last year wasn't quite as bad, at least from the customers we're hearing from, wasn't quite as bad as we expected because we saw that that um, uh, a lot of customers returned to brick and mortar. So that, that final mile delivery was taken care of by them. Um, and really what we saw was a lack of inventory. Um, as you can see, it, it, it was significantly smaller, uh, uh, there was significantly less inventory than expected because of, of ports, because of manufacturing, because of, of basically the rest of the supply chain having problems. Uh, Mark, did you guys see anything similar to this or did you have anything you wanted to add to basically what we, what we actually saw last year? Yes, uh, this is really what we saw from our shippers and uh, those that we are consulting to as well. 2021 was a bit quieter, uh, and I think that it had some of the same uh, challenges as 2020, but what happened in 21 is that there was better awareness, and there was a sort of relief valve in your second bullet here of customers returning to brick and mortar, and that muted what would otherwise have been a much more challenging peak. Yeah, it definitely it definitely did help, and and I think we're all happy <laughs> to go back into stores and and actually handle things before we purchase them. Well, let's let's ask our audience here. I'm going to go ahead and, and launch a poll here, and um, uh, let you guys uh, look at it and say, you know, what was your number one concern? And we'll try to uh, talk towards that as, as we go through here. So same questions that we asked in our other poll, you know, what, what is the most difficult thing for you? Controlling shipping costs, carry capacity constraints, adding options like same day, or just better inventory utilization. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and give this a little bit longer to go through. Looks like we're getting a lot of respondents. So as the numbers continue to, uh, uh, to change here, all right, we'll give this about another 15 seconds, I want to say. Okay. 
All right, and with that, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and share with our audience the results. Now, in this case, um, uh, we see a very different result than the one that, that, that we had out there, that controlling shipping costs by far is the number one concern. That's gonna be really good because, well, we're gonna be talking about uh, some of the surcharges and things you're gonna want to look at uh, throughout 2022 and beyond as we do that. Okay, excellent. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and let's move forward on a quick check, make sure I'm sharing everything. All right, Mark, do you wanna go ahead and let's talk about some, some major wins and losses that we saw uh, probably shouldn't be news to every, anybody, but something we want to have them keep in mind as we go through here. Go ahead, Mark. Sure. So just a few wins and losses that we saw from the peak of 21. Uh, one win is the U.S. Postal Service. Really, uh, they improved their year-over-year -year service uh, and brought on the help that they needed and also implemented most of their planned new capacity. So. By all measures, the U.S. Postal Service had a better peak, uh, and that doesn't mean that they are perfect, <laughs> but it does mean that there was a year-over-year -year improvement. Actually, 7% on-time service improvement in December week one, year-over-year. -year. Um, next is kind of a softer win, but a win nonetheless. I think that the retail employees got a little bit of a reprieve on Thanksgiving last year. Most of the major chains, Walmart, Target, Kohl's, Best Buy, and others, decided to take the entire day of Thanksgiving off and give that to their employees to enjoy with their families. Retail can be a crunch, especially <laughs> when it comes to Christmas time. So I think that that was a big benefit to those retail employees. Um, next, I think that we had a, another win and loss um, on the next slide. So another win, um, and this is from the perspective of UPS, right? It is a win, maybe a loss when we, <laughs> we think about it from a shipper's perspective, but a win for UPS, posting record profits, having better service year over year um, and is expected to cross 100 billion for the first time in 2022 as a company. Uh, they, also, uh, they also had slightly better performance year over year than 2020. Some of that is due uh, as a caveat to them actually changing their service standards in some of their three-day lanes. So they, they gave themselves an extra day and had better on-time service as a result of it. I have to, it pains me to say this because I still have some purple blood, but FedEx is a, a was a loss for this past peak. Um, it's difficult to assess it any other way. 2021, they had a worse on-time service um, specifically on their express products and specifically in making the time commits for the express services. If it weren't for those time commits, these the numbers would have been far better for FedEx. Um, FedEx continues to be optimistic and say that their ground division is getting better and getting more used to the new norm for both the organizational changes that they made and the additional e-commerce volume that has come with the pandemic. So I think those are a few quick wins and losses. I mean, Justin, would you think of any others? I mean, there, there's a lot out there, but I, 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 I wanna go back to the, um, uh, to the labor win. Uh, I think that uh, one of the things that, that all of us has noticed is, is that we have to be a lot more mindful in uh, dealing with labor um, and that the uh, pendulum has shifted. Uh, labor has been a concern in the logistics industry ever since I started, but it feels like it is at its peak now. And things such as uh, remaining closed or having extremely shortened hours during national holidays is one of those areas where we can see that the market is, 
is pulling back and providing concessions. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and, and let's uh, uh, let's move forward. Let's look at today. Um, and I know you wanted to cover uh, various things on, uh, we've already started to talk about UPS and FedEx, but let's talk about how UPS and FedEx are gonna affect us in this upcoming year. Right. So um, I appreciate the poll at the top of the presentation because really the two the two biggest things that people were concerned about in today's poll were controlling costs and then helping with some of the capacity constraints. And I think that as we go forward in the presentation, there will be some items to address both of those. So specifically on controlling cost, let's talk about the peak surcharges uh, for UPS and FedEx. So with the time that we have today, I'm gonna focus on UPS and FedEx, and I'm gonna focus on domestic, um, as that, that's where most concerns lie. So uh, because one type of peak surcharge was not enough, we have two different flavors for everyone to enjoy. The first one that I'm separating out is a demand surcharge. Those are the surcharges that the carriers have used the past couple of years on an ongoing basis for times outside of the holiday windows. And secondly, the second type of peak surcharge is the classic holiday surcharge that are in place between October and December. So two different kind of flavors of peak surcharge, and I wanna be precise in talking about each of those. So really, what does that look like on UPS and what did it look like in 21? Next slide, please. So for the demand surcharges, these are the ongoing basis for 22, um, and there were similar ones in, in 21 and 20. Um, you have additional handling and large package surcharge and you notice that these are in place for January 16th and beyond in 22. So these will be in place until either UPS revokes them or we get to the holiday period where other surcharges will take their place. And then the second type of demand surcharge is on the next slide. And that is where we have a peak factor. One thing that I wanted to uh, wanted to point out here is that for planning purposes on these peaking factors for both the demand and the holiday peak surcharges, UPS and FedEx are still stuck in February of 2020. It's been two years and they haven't changed their basis on which to uh, do their demand surcharges. So I do think it's quite time for them to update the expectations when we consider uh, February 2020 was a completely different landscape than what we look look at today. So yeah, those are many many customers have have doubled and even tripled the amount that they're shipping uh, as their customers have have really moved on as they you know even the boomer generation has moved on and made uh, e-commerce shopping and therefore shipping part of their normal life. Absolutely. So both of the carriers had double digit growth uh, in 2020 and that has been maintained. And so it's a new world. Um, and I think that they need to adjust that. So now that we've talked about demand surcharges and what those look like for UPS, there are also these peak surcharges that happen during the course of the actual holiday peak. And again, we have additional handling and large package surcharges and notice the holiday flavor, if you will, is more expensive than the demand or the ongoing. It's very important to note that all of these peak surchar surcharges are additive to their regular counterparts. So on one package, you could have an additional handling, then you could have a peak additional handling. 
and those, those two charges are additive for the same box. Also, when we look at 2020 to 2021, the additional handling and large package surcharges went up by 20% on list. So year over year, these are um, getting stricter in their application and they're also getting more expensive when they are charged. So let's take a brief look at FedEx. Um, and this, oh, by the way, uh, the peaking factor is different for UPS inside of the holiday period. And that, that slide is, is saying that. So let's go to FedEx. FedEx similarly has uh, two different types of peak surcharges, both demand and holiday. Right now, one of the demand surcharges for FedEx is a 60 cent per package charge on all residential deliveries. One thing that is embedded in FedEx's changes that's not called a peak surcharge, but is one nonetheless, is baked into the GRI, which is the FedEx economy, FedEx ground economy, $1 delivery and returns charge. So every package is automatically charged an extra dollar fee on both outbound and returns. It's not called a peak surcharge, but it is put in because of the increase in demand. So we've got layer upon layer of surcharges. Um, good thing we've got automated systems out there because I couldn't imagine trying to hand calculate this and have any <sighs> any understanding as to what my uh, accountants will expect for a bill. Yeah. So with you know with respect to time, let's let's go to some of that mitigation and what we can do to take care of some of these these surcharges so just like ups fedex had some of those same flavors and same values uh, of different surcharges and um, you can look at that at the pdf of the presentation as well uh, but let's talk about what we can do to really reduce these so two years of experiencing higher than normal gris at 5.9 percent as well as higher than normal peak surcharges really show us that we have to do something at this point to reduce the impact. So the first thing. Yeah, yes. Mark, is this the slide you wanna be on? Yes. Perfect. So the first thing that we do is to know our numbers. So have you shipped more than 25,000 packages in any given week since February, 2020? For many people, the answer is yes. If you have, then the peak, uh, then the, the peak factor is going to kick in for you and be evaluated. So, what was your February 2020 average weekly number? That's something that we need to know in order to calculate or project the impacts for this year. And what I'm suggesting is that you get these numbers for both your February 2020 basis, and then look at the year over year for both the, the package count and the occurrence of additional handling and large package and get your numbers in front of you. So that would look something like the following slides. If we look at a very simple analysis, just a simple spreadsheet showing us the weeks from October, the last of October into uh, December, then we can look at 2020, 2021, and, and project for 2022 what we're likely to see um, in terms of volume and how that relates to the, the peaking factor based on February 2020. So if we look at the November through December charges in the graduated colors here, you can see that some weeks are a bigger concern than others. And then secondly, if we're looking at additional handling and, and large package surcharges, so doing the same thing, we can look at October through December, look at what 2020 and 2021 look like, make some expectations in terms of costs. Here, what I did was uh, add 20% 
onto these surcharges because that was how much they went up from 2020 to 2021. So just having some simple views of your data and knowing how much you're spending on these things, knowing how much you're shipping, really goes a long ways to helping mitigate the cost. So what do you do with these numbers once you have them? The first thing you're going to do is you're going to try to negotiate better incentives. So yes, do the carriers have a lot of pushback towards negotiating surcharge incentives? Absolutely, but there's no better time than the present to start asking. And get, um, get this in front of your account rep so that 22 can be reduced before it gets here. Yeah, the um, ultimate uh, negotiation obviously is to remove all that capacity and move it to somebody else. So we're also at a good time of year to look at, at uh, that as well. Absolutely. So the first type of the first type of mitigation is through negotiation. The second is looking through operational changes that we can make. So apart from apart from having to um, negotiate with your carriers, we can also look at what is the right carrier mix. Do you have better rates on one carrier versus the other? Can you consolidate volume and have what Amazon has begin, begun to promote as an Amazon day, where you send all of one customer's shipments uh, the same day, rather than multiple deliveries on multiple days? There are several different uh, negoti or excuse me, uh, mitigation strategies operationally, and really there should be a reinforcement of ship from store, buy online, pick up in store, and brick and mortar promotions that honestly I think Justin contributed to a quieter peak for 21. I agree completely. Let's go, let's take a second here. We've got a couple of uh, uh, we had a couple of questions pull pull in here. So from uh, Allen Distribution, what are you forecasting the rate market to do over the course of 2022? Multiple sources are showing that it will begin to hold steady or decrease, while others are showing it will continue to increase. Now, of course, all of this is is ahead of uh, the all these predictions were done before the conflict in the Ukraine. Right, right. So one thing that we follow uh, with my team at Invista is we follow number one, what are the results of our negotiations over the past couple of years? And also we we look at different indexes that would indicate how this pricing market goes. So anecdotally in our RFP projects, um, we are seeing a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. So the last part of 21 was better from a negotiation standpoint than it has been. Um, we're now launching into the spring negotiations, which we expect to be better than the last half of 21. As far as indexes that we look at, there's the freight waves, shout out to freight waves, um, for creating the DHL supply chain um, pricing power index. That's freight related and should be looked at as general transportation. But what it indicates is how much pricing power a shipper has. The higher the number, the less leverage a shipper has. We've been tracking that as a trend, and I would have to agree. I think that it's going to stay much the same as it is right now um, until probably the end of summer towards the fall, simply because we're waiting for the labor force to come back as we see more of the country turn green on the <laughs> CDC's maps of it being safe to go back into the store, we expect pricing to get better. Um, so yes, I, I agree with some of the items that, that you've seen that say it's going to stay the same um, for quite some time now, uh, but we will, see, we will see better pricing as, as we continue forward. Um, let, let's uh, throw one caveat of an exception out there because um, with the uh, with the fuel embargo or the oil embargo from Russia, 
that's clearly already affected many of us at the at the gas station right now and i'm assuming that the the carriers will eventually have that reflect in your in your one week or two week rolling sur fuel surcharges so that'll be something to to make sure that your software is taking that into account as it rate shops between the various carriers you're attempting to balance and 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 leverage to to reduce your your logistics costs as much as possible while providing that that high speed service that your customers are expecting right, with that let's go ahead and let's let's talk about the expectations right so as as we as we look into this obviously very clearly controlling shipping costs is our number one concern and of the people on this uh, on this webinar uh, the vast majority 60 percent said that was the the number one thing and um, I was talking with a chapter of the uh, American Supply Chain Management um, uh, group in the Midwest here and had an entire uh, thing just on single carrier strategies are basically dead. Unless you're a relatively small shipper, a couple hundred per day, um, if you're above a thousand a day or more, you're probably, you're probably looking to expand the number of carriers that you're using. And I'm going to tell you, and this is not what, uh, and Mark, you, you covered this a little bit earlier. Um, uh, if you'd have asked me middle of last year, should I add the United States Post Office uh, in order to help uh, improve my, my customer service, I would have said no. I would say, yes, you want to have the United States Post Office because they cover everything and they will take all of your packages and get them to the customers. But as we saw, they made quite some improvements in their on-time uh, even though they, they may have adjusted what they consider to be on time, they've made some improvements to that, and it's become a lot more predictable in ways that businesses can use. Um, but I think really what we're looking at is, is adding new carriers, and you have to look at things such as what is their real cost? Um, uh, carriers can often go ahead and do a, uh, an evaluation for you on a set of uh, you know one month's worth of data, something of that nature, and let you know how is it going to work for them. How are they going to ship the cost for you? Make sure you understand their time in transit. A lot of the regional carriers, the ones that we may be very aware of, um, they may have shorter time in transits than the national carriers. Uh, a lot of the uh, the newer carriers that might still be being worked out. Um, uh, one of the big things I'm always concerned about as a software engineer is the data is going to have to flow through your software stack. Okay, bringing on your second carrier is a lot harder than bringing on your 10th carrier. Okay, so make sure you're prepared to do that properly. And of course, if we've given the carrier some information, uh, we want to understand what the ROI is going to be, because if we're going to have to change all that stuff in our software stack, that's going to cost us IT time, project management time, all these other things that we want to keep into account. Okay. All right, so we've seen some good things happen. Um, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I'm one of those people that that uh, uh, checks to see how many ships are anchored in uh, outside of uh, Port of Los Angeles and Long Beach. Um, that number is is decreasing. It used to be in the 30s and 40s a couple months ago. Um, as we hit the beginning of the year, it dropped into the into the mid teens, and now it's flirting with being single digits. So we are seeing at least some relief. Um, uh, in that now, please note. One thing I, I want to say is, is that we haven't gone back to pre-pandemic because back then ships were taking 22 days to get across the Pacific. Now they're just above 40 days, so they're they're going slowly, so they don't have to spend so much time parked. When we see that number really start to go down, it's my opinion we're going to start to see a lot more inventory, uh, a lot more uh, inventory availability. But there's a second thing that we're seeing as part of this as well. Manufacturing is moving back. A lot of companies, and it's all over, whether it's the Wall Street Journal, Business Insider, you know, all of these sources are talking about how companies are um, onshoring a lot of stuff. Um, uh, onshoring a lot of stuff and are going ahead and, and um, uh, pulling things within regions. So those there's going to be maybe an American region or just a North American and a South American region. A uh, uh, Western European region, an Eastern European region, and an Asian region. So we're seeing a lot more of this, uh, not one spot, not one uh, manufacturing plant to, uh, in one area or a set of manufacturing plants all in one country that could be affected by a localized uh, pandemic issue. So as we see these things, 
um, we are seeing some of it might take effect this year, depending upon how long some of the supply chains are. We are seeing more and more regional independence, uh, uh, which will should help with inventory long term. We are still seeing a strained carrier capacity. Um, we are still expecting this year that there will be uh, uh, carry maximum quotas provided by the carriers. They will be very strict like they were last year. Uh, we will probably hear of companies uh, severing contracts because they, uh, uh, they they provided too many packages and uh, the carriers needed to move away from that. Um, so there's a lot of things going on there. And at the, the larger end of the retail chain, chain we are seeing a lot more um, carriers, I'm sorry, a lot more companies take that themselves, take on the, the last mile themselves. So we've seen Walmart uh, uh, bring up Go Local. Uh, American Eagle Outfitters, they've, they have purchased Airterra. Um, Staples has High Touch. We're interesting, we expected to see more about that one, but, but we haven't quite seen that yet. And of course, probably one of the largest ones outside of Amazon themselves is Target, who many, many years ago purchased Shipped and has since purchased other properties, other, uh, uh, car uh, other uh, carriers and rolled them in, including all of Delive and Grand Junction. Okay, so I think this leads to uh, uh, another question. So Dan from BRP asked, how much has Amazon's network affected UPS and FedEx volumes? And I think, uh, I think Mark, we're each gonna have different answers on that. I'll let you go ahead and get started with one. Yeah, so I, I think that from a FedEx standpoint, um, Amazon has a much more limited effect simply because FedEx does not carry for them any longer. Um, that doesn't mean that Amazon doesn't have a peripheral effect on shipping in general. And honestly, if we need a, a disruption to cause the pendulum to swing the other way, uh, as far as capacity goes, I think Amazon could very well take its own volume out of the network and provide some capacity slack at UPS. UPS reported again that Amazon is greater than 11% of their overall total revenue. So there's a lot of eggs in the one basket. And if that, if Amazon decided to carry everything itself today that it's currently giving to UPS, that would cause a bit of a vacuum that could help. Yeah. And, and from our side, uh, we see Amazon as not only are they covering their own packages, but now in software like ours, it is capable to use uh, Amazon as a carrier. So even for goods that may not have been sourced on an Amazon marketplace. So the technology is there, it's dormant, but we do see that, that as soon as Amazon wants to pull that trigger, they can very quickly become either a same day carrier nationally, uh, which would be very interesting. We're gonna talk a little bit about some, some same day carriers here in a minute, but um, uh, they could become a same day carrier or if they wanna leverage their, uh, their back end logistics, they could become a national carrier. We don't have any indications that any of that is happening now, um, but it is available in the technology that, that um, most multi-carrier shipping software should be integrated to at this point in time. So just and something to note. And, and really, because it goes right along with what you've been speaking about the last couple of slides here, is in some ways I view this, Justin, as being Target's kind of way of following Amazon's lead. Yes. Amazon's building out its own network, Target and some of the other large retailers are as well. All right, moving on. So. I think the next thing we did definitely want to talk about is the uh, uh, the reality of crowdsourced carriers coming up, right? We're seeing them all over the place. Um, Delive, we just talked about, they were probably one of the larger crowdsourced carriers. Um, and it's really about how are they going to move from where their sweet spot is now, right? Because right now, groceries, um, it, it, they're killing it. Grocery and food delivery, we're seeing that everywhere. But the question still stands, how are we going to deal with high value items like, like 
uh, electronics, jewelry, and controlled items like uh, prescriptions. We know this is being asked in the market because we're getting asked the question. Um, we're looking to see how any of that solidifies. I'm gonna say right now, the jury's out. Mark, have you seen anything different? No, I think you're right. The jury is still out because I think the I think that retailers have to figure out how to catch these items in the periphery. If you already have an avenue that's delivering groceries and you're a big box store like Target, how do you convince a customer that they should slip in their new iPad <laughs> into into their grocery order. So there's a little bit of a logistical challenge there and kind of the way that consumers think about buying these separate things, perhaps even from the same company. Yeah, agreed. All right, carry diversification. I know we've talked about it. Let's go into a little bit more detail. You know, um, when do you start diversifying? Honestly, if you're already under carrier capacity constraints right now, if you only have one carrier, you should at least start adding United States Post Office now. That's just my 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 two cents worth of free advice at any point in time. You need to have at least one national carrier in the United States Post Office, regardless of how big you are. Um, going forward, once you get up to a certain amount, and that will vary, uh, there are there are people like Mark out there who can tell you guys determine exactly what spend to have so many carriers, but if you already have multiple carriers and you're looking for more you really need to be started now okay um especially if we want to be prepared uh for for peak season how are we going to do it well of course that depends upon um uh, depends upon what your constraints are like i said adding the second carrier is a lot more difficult than adding that 10th carrier right because you want to make sure that your software stack comes in there that we've got data flowing and that it is not the job of the individual in the warehouse who's applying the label to make the decisions. We want those decisions to flow and be automatic, to be time sensitive. Um, so you might make a different decision at six o'clock in the morning than you would at six o'clock in the evening because your trailers have started to pull, okay? Um, probably one of the most difficult things with this and, and um, uh, one of the things if you deal with, with a company that's helping you negotiate rates you're going to try to go to a specific um, volume to make the best discounts with that carrier okay now with that you want to look at you know what is the minimum spend they want me to have over whether it's a 13 week or a 52 week rolling average there's also they may also put a cap at the top of that as the number of packages now that's the probably the difficult part is, is you end up with dollars at the bottom raising the number of packages you ship but number of shipments you can ship at the top closing that gap down so there's a bit of a bit of uh, uh, discongruity between uh, the ways the carriers are trying to incent us uh, or the, the the actions they're trying to have us do so using a, a process like carrier volume balancing can help to balance between those carriers while still trying to drive your overall logistics costs down as much as possible okay and of course if you've got more than one carrier you've got to be looking at rate shopping if you don't stop rate, if you don't start rate shopping, you're not going to be able to determine that you can save sometimes dollars on shipments. Um, uh, Pre-pandemic uh, anecdote here: uh, we were working with a with a um, uh, a drug manufacturer that had a lot of samples being shipped uh, or a lot of small volumes being shipped, and they were continuously shipping things next day air, which would have been delivered by the same driver. Uh, on a ground shipment the next day. So you, know, um, you can imagine one day <laughs> express versus ground shipping, um, that was quite a healthy ROI that was available. Now you may not be that eg egregious in, in uh, uh, not looking at rate shopping, but even with uh, basic rate shopping, we see a lot of customers save, uh, save a good uh, five or 6%. Looking to simplify and automate your parcel shipping decisions? ProShip offers three unique rate shopping options for fulfilling delivery promises and enabling positive customer experiences. Basic parcel rate shopping sorts the rates for all carrier services within one system and selects your lowest cost rate to ship each parcel. 
Factoring in numerous carriers, modes, and services amplifies complexity, leading to time in transit rate shopping, which includes basic rating capabilities and filters by the number of business days in transit. Finally, there's the most cutting edge and complex option, advanced date shopping, which includes service level pickup, transit, and delivery days. With ADS, you can promise delivery by specific dates while ensuring you're still selecting the lowest cost service. ADS is complex because an additional seven data sets are being considered, like label creation times, last trailer pulls, and carrier holidays. No matter what, ProShip multi-carrier shipping software makes complex parcel shipping challenges simple and cost-effective with advanced rate shopping capabilities. All right, we pulled that up just so you guys can see what the basic, what the three levels of rate shopping are uh, in order to uh, uh, simplify it. Because Mark and I would probably have taken 15 minutes to have explained that, but uh, we wanted just to jump through that one real quick there. All right, let's move on. Simplify oh, let's move on, there we go. So Mark, let's look at uh, let's look at some of the some of the balancing that needs to happen. So let me throw it over to you for now. Sure. So one part of realizing have the benefit of having all of those carriers available to you is in the rate shopping and the execution piece. But how do you plan, and what what is your plan for your program of how many carriers and who is going to take what and and how are you going to be serviced in that way so the two the two kind of facets here having a good plan and a good mix of carriers as well as executing on that rate shopping and picking the right one when you actually create the label and pre-pandemic if we talked about revenue tier balancing or we talked about carrier mixing it would look a little bit like this simple scale. We might have two carriers, we might just have to balance FedEx and UPS, but now it's almost like a senior level physics problem uh, with a, a complex pulley system because now you have all of these carriers, UPS, DHL, US Postal Service, FedEx, and then supplementing at points on regionals and different niche carriers. So when we look at revenue tier balancing, what we're trying to do is take into consideration the revenue tiers that are placed on us by UPS and FedEx, and then take into account what we have to change as a result of giving some away some of that volume to other carriers. So if we look at the next slide, this is kind of a, a real simple graph that everyone has probably created for themselves or, or looks at on a, a regular basis. So your UPS and FedEx revenue attainment have different tiers, uh, tiers one through maybe even as many nine tiers. And then you have a rolling weekly average or in FedEx's case, an annual average. Whenever you have a new carrier that you're implementing, it takes away some of this revenue attainment. So in order to determine impacts, you have to first be able to price out from a revenue contribution standpoint on gross or published package prices, and then compare that to how much volume you're going to take out of your regular carrier, UPS or FedEx or both, as you implement the new carrier. And it's a very surgical process that you need to take because one moving one tier down can cost you as much as 5% on your discounting. So with all of the new carrier strategies that are coming into the fold of not only utilizing as many carriers as possible, but piloting these new ones that have popped up, we have to be very careful that we don't end up costing ourselves a lot of money uh, when it comes time to working with the national carriers. Now, another just aside here is that when you are negotiating with the national carriers, the revenue tiers and the levels that you have to hit for certain incentives can be negotiated as well. And that's that's what you need 
uh, help on. And of course, um, you know, groups like ours uh, do that on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and that's something that we have to look at to have a good plan. Yeah, and you know what, that's a perfect time to throw in one of the questions here. Um, uh, New Pig is asking, does ProShip offer the analysis that we're showing? And the answer is no. That's why we partnered with Invista, because people like Mark and team, they go ahead and take all the data that we put out, combine it with, with uh, uh, your invoice data, and they provide you a lot of the, you know, uh, of the, uh, how can I get more out of an installation like a ProShip? How can I better negotiate with my carriers? While ProShip continues to have great relationships on the execution side with the carriers, it's a good balance that lets us, each of us, do our respective jobs appropriately. All right, carrier expansion, right? So um, uh, we're gonna probably go through this a little faster than I expected. I noticed we've got about 10 minutes left. We will try to stay a little later for questions for those of you who are interested. Uh, so let's, let's kind of do a last call on questions. Please get those in if we can. Um, so car characteristics, um, I think the big thing that we're looking at here is there's a lot of startups and there's a couple of areas we want to look at. And regardless of, and so I'm going to jump to the bottom here and then work my way back up. Um, regardless of whether you're using a carrier who's been around for multiple decades or, or, or somebody who's just been funded in the last uh, couple of years, um, pilots are a must. Uh, we see that with a lot of same day solutions going on right now inside ProShip because we have a lot of retailers, um, just pilots, certain areas, uh, certain different carriers. Uh, but it's definitely something that we want to look at uh, as capacity continues to grow, as consumer desire shifts back and forth between brick and mortar and e-tail, um, we are going to see a fluctuation. And it's inevitable that we're going to see some of these new carriers not make it. We're going to see some of these new carriers combine and join. Uh, let's face it, uh, we ended last year with a big announcement that uh, LaserShip bought on track and they're somehow going to knit everything together and then grow as a carrier to cover more than 80% of all U, uh, of all U.S. addresses. Okay, um, but Mark, I definitely do want to want to touch on financial backing because I know you guys evaluate carriers uh, uh, on a lot of resources. We will evaluate their technical resources, um, such as what technologies they're using, what services they're offering. But you guys are more looking at, as you mentioned, how are the carriers doing? How is FedEx versus UPS doing? Is there anything, any specifics you'd want to bring up when it comes to the financial backing of some of these newer startups? Well, a lot of them have private equity investment. And you actually can see in their announcements how much backing they have. So several uh, several of us in the industry have created various graphics of how much backing there is. Um, you know, Nate Skyver, who is is a colleague, um, has done a great job of that. Um, he's uh, he's pointed out how much each of these individual carriers have as as backing. But something you know that I that I would say about a lot of the startups categorically are using the U.S. Postal Service uh, for final mile delivery. So they're, they are new startups, but really a lot of them have a, a difference on the front end. And ultimately this volume ends up in the Postal Service. So, you know, I know you're going to speak towards these consolidators and, you know, that that makes up a lot of a lot of ground with the new startups that are happening. Yeah, and and, and there's one thing I have noticed, let's face it, there's been postal consolidators ever since we've had um, electronic means of, of filing for things. Um, and in many cases, they haven't lasted very long. Um, I would say it's one of the, one of the riskiest uh, carrier types to be involved in. They can save costs, right? Um, they can uh, uh, often uh, either save costs or or speed up the delivery because they're going to skip several steps and go straight uh, to the closest uh, uh, postal component possible. Um, but we've seen a lot of them struggle to stay in business. Now, because we have such uh, an increased volume in uh, e-commerce shipping, maybe that's not going to be the case. Maybe we're going to see a lot more postal last mile. 
maybe with the improvement in postal delivery we saw last year, that's a lot of maybes. Okay, so all we're saying is, is make sure you do your research. If somebody comes to you and, and, and says they're gonna do the pickups for you, they're gonna do the sorting, but they're gonna use the, the post office or maybe some other carrier as the last mile, make sure you truly understand it. Make sure you understand how things have happened in the past because we've seen a lot of carriers go through this and not do exceedingly well. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned pilots, Justin, and that really is every facet of how you use a, a carrier, uh, from mm -hmm. operationally pickup and delivery, but also reporting and back office. Does it work in your accounts payable process? Can it be coded to how you want to pay the bills? So there's a lot of work to be done in integrating a new carrier that hasn't maybe quite worked out the entire package life cycle and payment for it all right so take key takeaways here the inventory issues are improving uh, they haven't been fixed but we can see a lot of ways in which they're improving planning is the key if you are looking to add carrier capacity now is the time when you should be planning now is the time when you should be bringing together your internal teams, your external teams, your vendors and the like, and determining what you're going to do for 2022. Um, and we are seeing that, that, that our, our, so the last one there is really about, are you going to have the right carrier capacity? Because as inventory uh, metrics improve over this year, as, uh, cause many, many vendors are purchasing early, uh, you might have uh, purchasing managers that are just filling warehouses right now. Are you actually going to have the carrier capacity to transfer custody to your customers? So that's really a lot of what we were looking at today. Um, we are at uh, about four minutes to the top of the hour. Um, uh, Mark and I are going to stay on a little bit here. We're going to go through some of these questions. Um, probably one of the more technical questions that's on the list here. Um, is uh, from MSC Industrial Direct. How vulnerable are the small parcel carriers, UPS, FedEx, and the United States Post Office to uh, cyber attacks? What security measures have they added to shore up the defenses? Are they currently working with the FBI and others? Uh, while I can't answer how much they work with, uh, uh, how much they work with the various three-letter agencies and what they're doing on their side of the firewall, uh, what I can say is, is that throughout our entire uh, 20 plus years in the industry, uh, we've actually seen them improve uh, the technologies that they use to communicate your customer data back and forth. But the it, the idea here is is it's always improving. Uh, I have to say that that from a communication or from a uh, EDI standpoint, um, the United States Post Office has by far been uh, the laggard, but even they have caught up to more. Um, uh, acceptable standards at this point in time. Um, and uh, we also have to look at the fact that, remember, you should not be sending anything other than name and address uh, to the carriers. So when it comes to PII, it is PII, but it's a very limited profile of PII to begin with. So um, that being said, uh, there's still more spaces that we're negotiating with the carriers to try to improve. And we expect that to continue to improve going forward. All right. Um, Daniel from EWTN Religious Catalog says, what are the parameters of additional handling? Mark, is that something that you've got an idea on? Yes, so there, there are a lot of different criteria to which additional handling applies, um, and those can be found in the service guide. But just a real quick rundown, um, there are new conditions that have been added in the past couple of years as well. Um, so for additional handling, you're looking at things that are too long, not encased in a container. Um, recently, poly bags were added to the list as additional handling, um, but a comprehensive list of those is available in the service guide, and I, I would love to provide that to you, Daniel. So um, I'll get your contact and send that to you. All right, and speaking of Nate, Nate has joined us today and he has asked, with increased retailer awareness and interest in regional final mile carriers, do you expect to see these carriers cut off new business by Q3 
like we saw in 2021? If so, are there other alternative carriers you expect to step in and meet this demand? Um, I'll take a first whack at that and give you a chance to, to put your thoughts together there, Mark. Uh, so far, none of the carriers have indicated to us that they're going to create a pause. Uh, that being said, um, there's going to have to be cutoffs, right? Um, uh, even, uh, uh, and, and let's let's separate this. There's a cutoff between them negotiating new business and when that business has to be in place for. Now, when the business has to be in place, I think that's not going to change. There's still going to be uh, a, a September, October. You have to have your system up and running. We have to have done all the checks make sure data is flowing, make sure your labels are good and all that, okay? I don't think that's gonna change. Uh, but what may change is how late in the year they're willing to negotiate with a customer to start that process. Mark? I agree with you. Uh, um, the earlier, the better to get started because I, I do think that there is a chance that they will cut it off, although they haven't made any announcements about that yet. All right. So David Burke from Restech said, can you save money shipping in smaller packages, DIMMs, based on smart packaging? Is there a good software to assist in this process? Well, the answer clearly is yes. Any, any air you are shipping is costing you money, okay? Unless you're shipping bricks, right? <laughs> you know, the really, really dense items, even if there's a little air, there's not much of a problem. Um, but if you have anything, consumer electronics, uh, clothing, anything that is that is lighter, yeah, you want to use as small a box as possible. Uh, a lot of WMSs will have um, uh, software to help with that. Um, uh, it, I often refer to it as cubing logic, but there are also companies out there that will create the box that will have the least amount of void fill for you. So there's a couple ways about it you can go to 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 look at reducing your dims. Um, uh, and some core manufacturers will help you with that. Um, but if you are looking specifically for, uh, uh, you know, given X box sizes, uh, ProShip partners with some, um, with uh, uh, cubing logic companies that can help pass that information along uh, to, your care, to your users. Mark, do you wanna to add to that? No, I, I think you hit it really. Uh, it, it, it's all about, the right size packaging for what you're shipping, eliminating any kind of air that you would otherwise ship. Here's an interesting one. Uh, Fritz from Trades of Hope. Uh, what about pricing for USPS packaging above one pound in services? Are we seeing any change in that, Mark? I think that this is clearly a you question. <laughs> Uh, not really a lot of change in terms of what's offered, but the classic services that are offered by the post office are the ones that are getting better on on-time service and reliability. And those are priority mail and parcel select. And many, many of our shippers are at least exploring the postal service if they haven't already implemented a piece of it. Okay. And one of the frequent listeners to our webinar, Steve Congro from Saddle Creek asked, given FedEx's on-time performance hit um, with their shift in uh, the, to smart post for, to ground economy, do you see FedEx reversing course in come, some cases to improve that, uh, that on-time performance? No, I don't see FedEx reversing course. I think that what we're going to see is those numbers are going to get better. Um, FedEx, in the middle of the pandemic, decided that it would make a significant operational change. And that was their uh, delivery density project, which pulled the previous smart post packages that were being delivered by the post office into FedEx ground and its network. And for that reason, it's been very difficult to staff appropriately at the FedEx ground unit. Another thing that would really help the on-time service and that, uh, that I think that is kind of buried in some of the numbers is one analyst stated that 6% of the problems with uh, 
FedEx's service. So that means an on-time service would be better by 6% if we looked at only same day um, or didn't look at commit time misses, basically. So we get it there on the day that it's promised, but not the time that it's promised. Oh, that's um, a improvement. So basically, yeah. it didn't get there by five, but it got there by seven. That's right. So a lot of FedEx's misses are same day lates. Um, and I think that that's going to be improving throughout the course of this year. I do think, and FedEx has stated publicly, that they think that their labor situation is going to improve as we go through 22. So what you're saying is, is they could improve their on-time performance like the post office did by just redefining their performance. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, the there post office and UPS both did that, frankly. Um, All right, we've got one from Rocky Mountain here, um, and I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to read through the whole question and just take part of it here. What solutions, automated or otherwise, are becoming widely used to deal with the ever-increasing surcharge rates? Uh, we try and minimize void space, oversized shipments, audit carriers where they wrongfully claim larger dimensions. And this is kind of a little bit like the one we we uh, we picked up earlier. Um, and and so we've already talked about um, there are there are machines out there that'll create the smallest box. Um, there are uh, algorithms you can use to provide your operators with the the smallest box potential um, but I think uh, I, I want to focus for a second there mark on the audit piece um, yeah. what does somebody like Invista do to help ensure that the carriers aren't uh, uh, generously rounding up if you will yes so Invista does have auditing services where um, each month uh, if signed up for that service, we look at shipper data to see if they've been charged appropriately with the dimensions as one of several different facets that the rate audits check. Um, they're also looking for misapplied residential fees, additional handling fees when there, was, there wasn't any uh, condition to warrant that. So there are several different auditing points that, that we offer as, as a result of the service that we have at Invista for Audit. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I think the, go ahead. In, in addition to having a partner um, audit uh, your invoicing data, one of the best defenses to all these fees is really knowing how you get them in the first place. It's just to, to, to be educated and understand what the service guide says for all the criteria that are going to be hitting your packages. Yeah, and from a software side, of course, if you're providing a software like ProShip good data, um, and you are you have expanded your rate shopping large enough to cover more carriers, cover more services, we should be providing you with the actual uh, the the courtesy rates that are provided should be as close to actual as practical, um, giving you time to actually uh, or giving you the capability of actually selecting the lowest cost. Combine that with the with Again, whether it's a cubing logic, a box builder, um, uh, and auditing, uh, really the number one point here on on saving in dim weight is providing the right data to your multi-carrier shipping software because it should be uh, leveraging every service you have uh, reasonably in order to do that. Um, all right, so I'm going to go with one more here because we are starting to, to go a little over time here. For smaller organizations, what do you recommend to increase increase negotiating power when I don't have enough pricing power to support two carriers? Uh, this is Leslie of Red Remedies. Now, with that, I would say uh, I'm going to immediately come and say that that uh, UPS has been notorious for doing 30% price increases, take it or leave it. I am positive there is room to negotiate there. I am positive that another carrier can provide you better. Uh, rates than that. Uh, as I mentioned before, even just including the United States Post Office uh, can provide your your non-time committed services uh, with a significant decrease in logistics cost. I think the only concern I would have, or if I was a small shipper, Mark, is uh, is removing that volume really going to put me in that bad of a tier with a major carrier. What's your thoughts yeah. on that? 
Yeah, and it can. Uh, so you do have, when you have less spin to work with, then you do have less negotiating leverage. However, the one point of optimism that I would say towards the smaller and medium-sized shippers is that you actually are the shippers that FedEx and UPS want to negotiate with in the present time. Because, because of your size, you command less volume discounting and you're more profitable for them. So this is a very tough environment. It's even tougher if you are shipping $70 million plus in shipping every year. Um, those, are, those are the tough negotiations right now where there is a lot of spend and a small amount of capacity. Uh -huh. um, we're going to go ahead and close up. Thank you all for attending. Uh, if there are more questions, uh, feel free to email either of us. You see the uh, contact numbers up on the screen and the email addresses. And with that, I want to thank everybody. Mark, I'd like to thank you for attending and uh, have a good day, everybody. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, everyone.